Let's pray. And Father, we do praise you and worship you and thank you for your great love. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us, your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Father, for your desire to save us and draw us into your presence so we can know you and experience you and walk with you. Give us, Father, understanding this morning to your text. Open our eyes, our minds, our hearts to what you're saying. Help us to see what you want us to see, Father. Reveal to us you as you wish to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we said last week, chapter 40 is a transition from the prophecy phase of Isaiah during Hezekiah's day, the invasion of Assyria, God's deliverance to Judah from Assyria, Jerusalem specifically. And then 40 is transition into all future events, which I think primarily deal with the Messiah's first coming and second coming. Of course, the world wants to deny that statement and say, no, it's all written after the exile uh, once they return back to Jerusalem. But that's, well, chapter 41, I kind of pretty much say that's impossible if we're going to say that God is God and this is God's word. Uh, so God will state some facts in verse 41 to make that very clear. That he is our Savior, the false gods, the idols are false and useless. And he will, but I'll give three statements from the chapter to communicate what he is saying. Uh, something that I am in moving toward as I go through 40 and following, it's kind of hard to, to do a traditional sermon where there's going to be this grand revelation and point because there is a, a lot of information in here that you really have to dig for. It's almost like it's a mystery novel. And you need to pay attention very closely to what's being said so you don't miss a clue for what's coming. It's like a scientific document that needs to be analyzed very carefully because there are things happening that if you miss, it'll blow up in your face. Or in this case, if you miss, well, then you'll miss it. And you miss the truth and the reality of the power of the text. So I want you to focus on it and maybe... During the week, take an hour or so and read chapter 40 one day. And then the next day, read chapter 41. Just about an hour, read it through slowly over and over and see what God reveals to you. Because there's a lot of structure here that I think is bypassed by most of the commentators. They just want to tell you what it's talking about, the symbolism, and move on. But I think God is really laying out a very, very tightly put together book of information concerning him, who he is, and what he is doing to save both his people and all of humanity. So if we run through it, we're going to miss it. So it's going to be kind of academic. That's my apology for being academic. Because it's not always exciting, you know. It can be kind of boring and dull. But we will try and make sure that doesn't happen, right? We'll throw things at each other, whatever it takes to stay away. <laughs> so the first statement that God's going to make here is that he is in control of world events. That's verses 1 through 7 of chapter 41. <clears throat> coastlands, which is not his people. It's everyone when he says coastlands. It's a, a term meaning peoples of the world, if you will. Listen to me in silence and let the peoples gain new strength. Let them come forward, then let them speak. Let us come together for judgment, who has aroused one from the east, whom he calls in righteousness to his feet. He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword, as the wind-driven chaff with his bow. He pursues them, passing on in safety. By a way he had not been traveling with his feet. Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and have come. Each one helps his neighbor and says to his brother, Be strong. So the craftsman encourages the smelter, and he who smooths metal with the hammer encourages him who beats the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and he fastens it with nails so that it will not totter. Uh, verse 1, God enters into a conversation with the people of the world, coastland, and, and some uh, churches may say islands. Uh, again, remember this, people of the world, not specifically his children, Jews. God calls them into a discussion of judgment. And the commentary that I'm reading that I like 
says it's like a, a picture it as a court scene where they're calling forth witnesses and bringing up evidence to prove the point, prove the fact, reveal the truth. So he's calling the world into a discussion of judgment or consider this. Uh, he asks, who has done what is about to be done? He asks us. He asks the world. What's about to happen? Who caused this to happen? Who made this happen? And God reveals that he is bringing up the one who is the conqueror. The one who is roused up from the east, who conquers everybody he comes into contact with. Now, we pretty much believe that it's going to be Cyrus, the king of the Persian Empire, the first king of the Persian Empire, who literally does conquer everything. My initial thought when I came to the text was, this is Jesus that he's bringing up to go out conquering and to save. But that's probably not. Uh, I think somebody mentioned the double meaning earlier. Possibly, but I think it's going to be specifically referring to future events that happen on earth concerning man, concerning the Persian Empire and Cyrus and the exile and return from exile. Because the verse, the chapters that follow, that's where they go. They go towards Cyrus and those events. So the, the one roused up in the east, he doesn't call him by name here. He will later, but that probably is Cyrus who God is raising up to go forth and to conquer. Uh, God's point is he is the one who enabled the one here to succeed. He delivers nations to him. He subdues kings before him. He enables him to have success with great ease. He turns them to dust. He turns them to chaff. Uh, the, the, really, the Persian army has no difficulty in conquering the known world. Uh, they only run into trouble and get as far as Greece. And even there, they defeated Greece numerous times before hundreds of years later, they, they fell to Greece. So God makes this happen. This prophecy is future prophecy of what will happen. And this sets the stage for the coming discussion in this chapter that the false gods, the idols, can't tell you what the future holds, but God can. And don't miss this, because all those who say this was written after it happened, that makes verse chapter 41 garbage and trash because God literally says, you know I am God because I tell you what is going to happen before it happens. Well, if they throw Isaiah out as not being the author because he can't write the future, then God's not God and he's calling himself a failure. So keep that in the back of your mind. There's no way Isaiah did not write this and tell us what's coming in the future. Uh, verse 4, who has performed this? Again, God raised up the Persian Empire. Uh, verses 5 through 7, the people's response to God's revelation and work. They are afraid. Verse 5, they tremble. They encourage each other. Verse 6, verse six they come together to encourage each other to be strong in the face of this mighty conqueror who is coming. And then verse 7, they turn to their idols and encourage them to build strong idols. Ooh gods they can worship who will defend them against this conqueror who is coming and the really great part is where it says saying of the soldering it is good and he fastens it with nails so it won't fall over <laughs> they must <laughs> nail their god to the ground so they won't fall over they can't even stand up on their own and yet they're going to bow before this, their God, and call it their God, their defender, their creator, their provider, their protector. It just cracks me up that ever in time in history, man would do that. But here they are. So they encourage the, the idol builders to build strong idols and nail them down so they can be stronger and defend them against the invading army that is to come. So again, it's a, it's a brief statement here. It sets the stage for the discussion that follows. God reveals he knows the past and he knows the future. Uh, God asks man if his gods can do this. Can his gods explain what has happened and tell you what's going to happen? And of course the answer is no, they cannot. The second statement God makes in chapter 41 is God protects his people, verses 8 through 20. Verses 8 and 10, 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts, 
and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you in my righteous with my righteous right hand. So God acknowledges his people, Jacob, uh, his descendants uh, from Abraham, my friend. It's a nice description there of God's relationship with the people, the descendants of Abraham, who he has called. Uh, he has chosen them. God put his people in their land. And do not fear, I am with you, he says, verses 8, 9, and 10. The idea he calls them from the remotest parts of the world. Well, this definitely is post-exile when God brings them back to Palestine, the promised land. Which is why I also thought the idea of his dealing with the Messiah because ultimately it is the Messiah in end times that brings all Jews back to their land and they rule there and he provides for them and reigns for them as king for a thousand years. But again, I think it's going to be more locally focused on the exile and return from the exile. So God is foretelling the future. He will restore them back to their land after the exile. Verses 11 through 14. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Verses 11 and 12, God will deal with all their enemies of his people. Verse 13, God will hold them by the hand. Great picture. And then 14, God, not man, is their redeemer and their savior. So he, he acknowledges who they are as his people. He will bring them back to the promised land, and he will defend them. He will protect them. He will take care of them. He will hold them, <coughs> he will hold them by their hand. Verses 15 through 16. Behold, I have made you a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them and will make the hills like chaff. You will winnow them and the wind will carry them away and the storm will scatter them. But you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. Again, the idea and word picture of them flattening the mountains illustrates their strength in God, illustrates how God empowers them to conquer and overcome and be safely, securely in their land. And as a result, they rejoice in the Lord who is their Redeemer. And then verses 17 through 20. The afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As the, the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. I will put the cedar in the wilderness, the acacia and the myrtle in the olive tree. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. And it's simply saying God will provide for his people water, food, resources for life. And the word pictures of trees in the desert, that doesn't just happen. If that happens, God does it. It's a miraculous event. And that's the point of the word picture. Is what is going to happen for them as far as resources and God providing for them will be miraculous and they will know that it's God who is working in their favor and taking care of them. The third statement. Uh, God proves he is. Verses 21 through 29. Uh, beginning in verse 21. Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong arguments, the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. And he's referring to the idols here. Let them come forward and declare. As the former events declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. Declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. Indeed, do good or evil, that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you are of no account, and your work amounts to nothing. 
He who chooses you is an abomination. Mm -hmm. 22 through the first part of 2023, let your gods tell us what is to happen in the future. The point of 41 is God is <laughs> revealing the future to Isaiah. And he says, bring your idols here. Let them reveal to you the future. If Isaiah 40 and following are not revealing the future, what is chapter 41 doing? <coughs> what is it saying? What's the point? Well, it's garbage. It, it means nothing whatsoever. God's point is, I will reveal the future to you. Your false gods, your idols, cannot reveal the future to you. The last part of verse 23. Give us reason to fear you to the idols. Do something so we have reason to fear you. Verse 24. You are of no account. You are nothing. And God just flat out says, your false gods are false gods. In the last part of verse 24 he who worships you is an abomination. And the, and the idea is he attacks the false gods and then he calls out the worshipers of false gods as being an abomination as well as the false god. Verses 25 through 29. I have aroused one from the north and he has come from the rising of the sun. He will call on my name and he will come up upon rulers as upon mortar even as the potter treads clay. Who has declared this from the beginning that we might know, or from former times that we might may say he is right? Surely there was no one who declared. Surely there was no one who proclaimed. Surely there was no one who heard your words. Formerly I said to Zion, Behold, here, are, here they are. And to Jerusalem I will give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there is no one, and there is none, no counselor among them. Who, if I ask, can give an answer? Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. God proclaims he is God because he reveals the future. In verse 25, again, he refers to Cyrus, the one from the north now, who will come and conquer. And the, the importance of this is when Isaiah writes this, Assyria is the empire that rules the world. And when Assyria is defeated, Babylon is the greatest empire the world has ever seen to that point. Wealth, power, culture, majesty, everything. No one could comprehend that Babylon would be defeated quickly. And yet, they were defeated overnight. Literally. When the Persians and Medes came together, they just pretty much walked through Babylon and defeated them. There was no battle for the city of Babylon. They walked in, and it was done. So that is not believable. They can't comprehend that idea. And God is telling them beforehand, this is what will happen. So when it happens, you will know that I am God. Verse 26, who has revealed since the beginning of the future? God always reveals to man what he's going to do. God always reveals to man before his wrath comes. God always reveals to man for his salvation comes because God wants us to see it and know it is God so we are drawn to God. God reveals himself. God reveals events, past, present, and future to draw you to him. The whole point of 41 is God will reveal the future to draw us to his presence. If Isaiah didn't write this, it was written after the fact, there's no prophecy of the future here, and it's a lie. And our God would be a false God. God always openly communicates with man so man can know him. Uh, verses 27 through 29, God has revealed to Zion, to Jerusalem, he has provided a Savior. Uh, the word formerly there, God has revealed before chapter 40 of his Savior. And they didn't hear. They didn't respond. They didn't acknowledge. Chapter 7, 8, and 9 refer to Emmanuel the Savior, and they didn't respond. They didn't accept it. They didn't believe. So formerly, God had told Zion, Jerusalem, the Savior, and they ignored him. They ignored the message of hope God gave them. Verse 28, no one is aware of the Savior. They have ignored God's revelation. And verse 29, their false gods have not revealed this to them. Only God has. Do you get the point, the setting, the framework the message of what Isaiah 41 is doing here. God reveals the future so we know that he is God and it draws us to him. 
false gods cannot do that, have never done that, therefore they are worthless. This statement in chapter 41, therefore, emphasizes, I think, yells out in a great way, Isaiah wrote this before the fact. Otherwise, it's all untrue. So, in the words of a former president, this is huge! Those who deny Isaiah's author destroy the whole message of chapter 40 and following by doing so. There is no message anymore. There's no reason for it to be in the Bible. God's argument is he reveals the future, not false gods. If Isaiah does not reveal the future, it's to say God's a false god. The hope of Israel, our hope, is God's revealing of the future. Right now, what is our hope? Christ returns. The Bible has revealed to us Christ will return. That's the future. Matthew 24. Revelation reveals what happens leading up to it. And afterwards, the thousand year reign. The Bible gives us prophecy of the future for our hope. Our salvation. His return. The end of this miserable world of pain and suffering. If there's no future revelation from God, is he God? And that's the point. So to, to deny God will do that. It's to deny God is God. Um, he wants us to know of his salvation for us. He wants us to know how he's going to save us. He wants us to be prepared for what's coming. And for, for this context in 41, he wanted people to know, I'm putting you in exile to save you. I will leave you in exile to save you. I'll bring you out of exile to save you. I will provide a savior for you. And I'll do this through my servant Cyrus who will conquer the world, free you, bring you home, and enable you to build your city, Jerusalem, and the temple in Jerusalem. He tells them before it happens. So when it happens, what are they going to do? That's all chance. He just got lucky. They're going to praise God because they see God's work being done in them and through them and for them. And the same thing is true for you and I. God reveals the future for the same purpose. So we can rejoice in his work in us and through us and with us. So again, 40 and 41 of Isaiah are huge transitional chapters moving from the prophecy of the first part to the prophecy of the second part which is future events of Christ's first coming and second coming of, of Judah, Israel's exile and then return and salvation. There are many things woven in here. We have to really dig at it and look at it to get the whole picture of what's being said. And these two chapters lay the groundwork for what follows. And that is future events. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will open our eyes to your prophecy in Isaiah, to your word in Isaiah, and give us, Father, a desire to spend time to read the text and to see what you revealed to us concerning how you communicated your holiness, the reality that you were God and there is no other, to Isaiah and through his prophecy. Give us both the comments to speak for you, Father, live for you, and shine for you where you place us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.